I had someone observe to me this week that this seems an odd choice for a lectionary text. And maybe it is. I mean, think about it. Why is it so important for us to hear what Jesus sent a bunch of people to do a long time ago? The answer is that it's not that important at all. Unless, unless we hear Jesus calling us through this story as well. So maybe that's why St. Luke saw fit to share this story with us. Maybe that's what we ought to take away from it. Or maybe not. I don't know. St. Luke isn't here to ask, so we kind of have to guess. Why is it that he's telling us this story? Even as I ask the question, I notice that implicit assumption that I so often bring, that I think we all often bring to biblical stories, that these stories are meant to give us some direction for our lives, to tell us what to do or how to do it. We want, we expect these stories to be about us. And very often on some level they are. But as I read this today, I'm remembering that we're not the focus of this book, are we? The protagonist of the Bible isn't Israel, it's God. The main character in these gospel stories isn't one of the disciples, it's Jesus. So with that in mind, let's come at this from a different angle. Let's start with a different question. What does this story show us about Jesus? Well, the first thing I notice is that last week in the story we read, Jesus sent some messengers ahead of him to a Samaritan village that he wanted to visit, and that village refused them. Do you remember what Jesus' response was? He went on to a different village. He didn't give up and go home. He didn't sit in the street and pout. He didn't call down fire from heaven, uh, as was suggested by the sons of thunder. He simply took his peace elsewhere. And some other lucky town got to host the Son of God while the first one missed out. This week, Jesus seems to be doubling down on that strategy. Instead of sending out one set of messengers, he sends out many. 70, or 72, depending on which manuscript you're reading, are appointed to go out to the towns that Jesus intends to visit. And the story suggests that these 35 or 36 pairs are sent to multiple towns each. You don't have to be a rocket surgeon to figure out that's a lot of towns. So what does that show us about God? What God is doing here? Moreover, Jesus seems to think that there's some urgency in this. As any farmer will tell you, harvest time is no time to, to linger. When the crop is ripe, you want to get it in before it spoils, and while the weather holds, and before anything else eats it. So Jesus looks out at all of these towns that he wants to visit, and he sees that the time is ripe for the gospel to be proclaimed. There are people there who need to hear this good news, and they need to hear it now. The number of people that he sends out suggests that the only way to get this harvest in on time is to hire more hands. And I also notice that the bulk of this story is instructions to these hired hands. Jesus isn't just sending them out with a message, he's sending them out as representatives. These people will be the embodiment of the gospel to the people they visit. Many of the instructions are a little bit inscrutable to us. It might sound more onerous than courteous to expect random strangers to feed and house uninvited guests, but there's just a little bit of a cultural difference there. These instructions are probably intended to uh, prevent the travelers from abusing the hospitality of their hosts or insulting them by turning down what's offered. But in any case, the instructions Jesus gives breaks down to three things. Eat with the people you visit, heal the sick, announce the kingdom. Hmm. That's the three things Jesus does. Luke's gospel in particular is very big on stories of Jesus eating with people. All kinds of people, from Pharisees all the way to tax collectors. To eat with someone isn't just about providing or receiving hospitality, it's about building community. 
It's one of the big reasons that our worship centers around a meal. Much like healing for the sick is caring for physical wellness, sharing table fellowship may be care for social wellness, another kind of healing. So here we have Jesus sending these folks out to do what he himself has been doing in anticipation of he himself coming to do that same thing later. In a real sense, these ones going out in Jesus' name are Jesus. They're sent out to be Jesus, to embody the gospel just like he does. He reminds them that when people listen to or reject them, they listen to or reject Jesus himself. It kind of reminds me, honestly, a little bit of the story of the feeding of the 5,000. There Jesus took five loaves and two fish and multiplied them to feed uh, 5,000 people with 12 baskets left over. Only in this story, God is taking one Jesus and multiplying him until there's more than enough to go around. So what does that show us about God? How does God choose to be present to those in need? I see in this story Jesus responding to rejection and failure by doubling down on a losing strategy. Maybe because he's not worried about converting anyone as much as he's trying to reach people who are already open to what God is doing through him. Instead of pulling back and regrouping and trying to refocus his efforts, I see Jesus being more generous, maybe even to the point of being prodigal with the gospel that he's been given to share. And I see him accomplishing this by inviting others to participate in his work. And then by somehow being present not just with them, but in them as they do that work. And when these 70 return to tell Jesus what they've experienced, their first response is to marvel at what they have accomplished, right? Even the demons submit to us in your name. But Jesus says, eh, small potatoes. That's inconsequential. What's really impressive, he says, is what God has done. God has written their names in heaven. Well, what the heck does that mean? I don't know about you, but my brain wants to hear this as a reward, right? Because you have done this, you will be rewarded with heaven. Because you have done this, your names are written in heaven. But that's the opposite of what Jesus just said, isn't it? What they have done is inconsequential. God hasn't written their names in heaven because of what they've done. God has simply written their names in heaven. Maybe that's even how they did what they did. Maybe the demons submitting to them in Jesus' name is evidence that this is already true. And so I find myself wondering if maybe Jesus is trying to get them to look up from what's right in front of them, the big flashy stuff, and see what God is doing in the bigger picture. What they have just witnessed, the power of God at work and the lives transformed by the gospel, that points to something that kings and prophets have only dreamed of seeing. What they have just seen and heard are the first glimpses of what God has in store for all of creation. The coming of God's kingdom. Paradoxically, this wonderful, joyful thing isn't evident to everyone. Not everybody receives this. Some towns will send the messengers away. It's not even seen by those people you would expect. It wasn't the wise, the priests, the Pharisees, the rabbis who saw this. But infants, neophytes, newbies, a bunch of random bumpkins who accepted Jesus' invitation to go eat with strangers in their homes with only minimal preparation. How marvelous that God should reveal the kingdom to such meager and insignificant people as this. And yet it isn't that the wise and the intelligent weren't invited, is it? I can't help but notice that Jesus doesn't choose to send people only to the towns that he knows will receive him. The invitation goes out far and wide, even, presumably, to the wise and the intelligent. 
Maybe it's not God who keeps the kingdom hidden from them, but their own ideas about God, who they think God is. When Jesus rails against Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, I don't think he's cursing them. I think maybe he's mourning them. I think he's lamenting the fact that if they had accepted the invitation when he was there, if they had deigned to listen to his message, then maybe they could have seen the kingdom as well. But what was it that kept them in the dark? What kept their eyes from seeing, their ears from hearing? In Luke's gospel, the wise and the intelligent, often personified by the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, are so often unable to hear Jesus' good news because it sounds so unlike what they expect to hear. In this story, I notice the towns that Jesus mourns are all towns in Galilee. That's his home turf. I seem to recall a sermon in which Jesus said no prophet is accepted in that prophet's hometown. Do you remember that one? Meanwhile, here's Jesus in Samaria, the place that everybody hates, going out to towns far and wide and seeing God's kingdom take root. One of the themes in the Acts of the Apostles, which is St. Luke's follow-up to this book, is that very often when the apostles go out to bring God somewhere new, they find God is already there waiting ahead of them. Philip meets an Ethiopian eunuch pondering scripture on a desert road. Peter watches the Holy Spirit descend on the Roman centurion Cornelius and his entire household, just as, it has, just as on us at the beginning, he says, before they're even baptized. Paul takes a trip to Athens and sees an altar to an unknown God and recognizes God's presence even there. Time and again, as that early community of Jesus' followers thinks they've drawn the circle around where God is, they find God waving to them from the other side of the line, and they have to draw the circle bigger. So, if that's who God is in this story, merciful, generous, prodigal, persistent, surprising, joyful, what does that say about who we are as disciples? I wonder if really that's the only way we can approach that first question we started with, the question about to what this story might call us. Because we can really only understand ourselves in light of who God is first. We are, after all, made in God's image. If we are to understand ourselves as the 70 in this story, we can't ignore the fact that those 70 and their task is defined entirely by who Jesus is and what Jesus has been sent to do. The story is less about what they do than it is about what Jesus does. And so, what is Jesus doing here, right now, among us? Where is Jesus going? In whose faces do we see him? Or in whose faces do we fail to see him? As we think about the future of the church and of this community, we are faced with a lot of questions about what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. The old paradigms that we've used for decades or sometimes even centuries don't work anymore. And the old doctrines don't seem to hold the same kind of power they once did. And so we're left asking who we are as Christians, as a community. And I wonder if contemplating the answer to those questions about Jesus will help us answer the question of who we are and what we are called to do.